이 시간 버달 목사님 나오셔서 기적 그 이상이라는 제목으로 말씀 전해 주시겠습니다. What he said. Well, good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. I do like the new setup and um, Wan Jong, you Deacon Jung. Oh, do they need to come together? Okay. Is this is this what we need to do? How am I? How are we doing? Is that better? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen, for all of your hard work on the sound system and the video system this last week. Um, we've got. I'm going to try to be brief this morning. How many of you know what a mirage is? You know what a mirage is. I, I wondered if that would be something that would be in both cultures. Wan Jong, by chance, do you have a picture of what I put up about more than a mirage? The, a mirage, I don't know, maybe you've been traveling on a very flat area, and way off down the road, you see a reflection that looks like water standing. Seen a mirage? Now, whenever I was a child, I liked to watch cartoons. Any cartoon lovers here? Uh, Miss April, I didn't expect your hand to go up, but that's wonderful. <laughs> um, whenever I was a kid, and one of my favorite cartoons that I watched was, oh, here we go. So, this looks like water. But when you get close to it, it's not. So whenever I was a child and I was watching cartoons, Bugs Bunny was one of my favorite cartoons that I would watch. And there was always a, uh, I'm getting lots of this in the congregation here, people like Bugs Bunny. There was always a storyline where Bugs or one of the people in the, in the TV show would be out in a desert. And they're crawling across the desert floor and they're crying, water, water, water. And way off in the distance, they see this oasis that looks like a Caribbean Riviera type thing. And they would run to this area that they thought was an oasis. And like an Olympic diver, they would jump up in the air. And then they would dive. And they would dive into more sand because it was a mirage. It was an empty promise. It was a trick that their mind played on them. And instead of the cool, satisfying waters that they anticipated, instead it was more sand, more disappointment, more thirst. Well, this morning I want to take us to a scripture. I want to take us to something that Jesus said in John chapter 7. If you will stand with me as we read through John chapter 7. We're only going to read three verses here. Um. It says, on the last day of the feast, and we can all read this together if we want to, on the last day of the feast, the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood there and cried out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like for you to uh, pay special attention here that um, he says anyone, not only those with a higher education, Anyone, not only those who work a white collar job, anyone, not only those that are adults, anyone, children, adults, grandparents, if anyone is thirsty, not the rich, not the poor, anyone, everyone is equal. He says, if anyone, and then he comes on later, just a, 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 a sentence later, and he says, whoever. So I think that we can take away from this that Jesus means whoever. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand that Jesus offers this to everyone. In John chapter 7, Jesus is attending this festival of tabernacles. It's called Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T. 
And it's a celebration that recalled the time that the Israelites were wandering through the desert and God gives his miraculous provision. It's the time that the, 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 the children of Israel dwelt in tents, like the tents that you camp in. It was also the time that the children of Israel were far from Egypt and they were thirsty and they wanted water. So God spoke to Moses and he tells Moses, he says, I want you to speak to the rock. And Moses disobeys and Moses strikes the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And water gushes forth and it gives water to the millions and millions of people that were traveling in the desert. It's during this time that God showed his miraculous power to flow water out of that rock and quench the thirst of the people in the desert. And John says, on the last and greatest day of this festival that commemorated the Exodus journey coming out of Egypt, and he says, let anyone. What I'd like to start out by telling you this morning is that it is easy to keep reading here, but yet totally miss what's happening in Scripture while Jesus is addressing the crowd that day. We read it and we just see words, but I want you to understand the backstory to why Jesus says this, because there is great importance to what Jesus says here. It's important because of where he said it. He was standing in the temple courts, right outside of the temple. It's important because of when he said it. Now, I want you to know that he said this on the last day, what John calls the greatest day. And this is a day that all of the water for the festival has probably been used up already. These people are sitting here while Jesus is speaking. And there's probably a thirst inside of them because all of the water for the ceremony has been used it's been poured out on the previous days. And the other thing that's important is that how he said it. John writes that Jesus lifted up, he shouted out, he raised his voice, and he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Now, he cried out. What you need to know is that this is kind of contradictory to the way that Jesus conducted the rest of his ministry. We don't see Jesus... Um, standing, preaching, shouting. In fact, the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 2, he says about the coming Messiah, he says, he will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. But on this day, this was different. The way that Jesus addressed the people was completely different than all the other times that he did. And I imagine that for those that were listening to Jesus on that day, when he says to them, keep in mind, they had just celebrated the Exodus journey. And when Jesus says to them, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, automatically their mind is going to go back to the stories of the Exodus. They're automatically going to think about how God supplied water whenever the nation was feeling parched. The Jews needed water and God supplied it. But Jesus seems to be indicating here that a believer's thirst is satisfied by the rivers of living water that flow from within them whenever the Spirit comes. This, this language sounds so much like another incident and another encounter that Jesus had with a woman at the well. One day Jesus is in Samaria and he's at a well and he meets this woman and this woman he, Jesus tells her about the water that he gives, that anyone who drinks the water that he provides will never thirst again. This sounds a whole lot like what Jesus says, but I imagine that it also draws the attention of these people celebrating the, the festival back to one of the things that um, Jeremiah says to the children of Israel. It was a prophetic message, and he says to them, he says in, in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13, he says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have also dug their own cisterns, 
broken cisterns that cannot hold water. I don't know if you're familiar with what a cistern is, but a cistern was a way that my grandfather, who was born in 1904, he told us about cisterns on his farm. And it was a way that they kept fresh water that they used to drink from. Can you imagine your water supply depleting and soaking out, seeping out, I should say, out of the, the, the barrels that you try to keep it in? A cistern was something that was in the ground that they dug. <clears throat> it was much like a well, only it was just a holding tank. You see, broken cisterns symbolize our futile human efforts to satisfy our own spiritual thirst. We do that and it leaves us desperate and unfulfilled. And Jesus suggests here, he says that unquenched thirst indicates a broken cistern in our soul. Our attempts, even though they're great and they are many, we attempt so many times to do God's work. In our attempts, in our own self, they're insufficient. Jesus talks to these people this day, and he understands that there is a need that they have, that you and I also have a need to recognize, this is a lot of words, we have a need to recognize our own need. We have a need to recognize our lack before we reach out and seek Him for spiritual fulfillment. Have any of you worked hard in the sun? Maybe it's in the garden. Maybe it's out in the yard. Maybe for you women, it's shopping. <laughs> Just making sure you're still awake. Have you ever worked up a good thirst? A good thirst. I mean a real good thirst. Like, before you wanted to talk to your spouse, you wanted something to drink whenever you came in the house. Before you wanted to pet your dog, you wanted something to drink. Before you wanted to turn the TV on, you wanted something to drink. Before you wanted to even get in the shower and clean yourself off, you needed to get something to drink. You just wanted to quench, quench your thirst. And I don't know if anyone alive today that doesn't know when they're thirsty. I don't know anyone that doesn't know when they're thirsty. Now, my precious little 82-year-old mama suffers from Alzheimer's. She doesn't know that she's hungry sometimes. She forgets to eat. That's very common. But what she doesn't forget is when she's thirsty. I've pulled up before. She's got in my car in her driveway. And I'll have something, and she grabs my drink and starts drinking. And I don't share with people my drink. That's, mm, I don't like that. But my little mama, she will drink my drink because she's thirsty. Even in her confused mind, she understands that she's thirsty. You see, church, there have been many times that you have noticed your own heart yearning for something that you just quite, can't quite grasp. The, the human heart is interesting because the human heart is designed to have desire. This is talked about in Psalm 34 or 37 verse 4 where it says, God will give you the desires of your heart. This is talked about. And sometimes those desires of our heart, they're not good. They're not good. They can leave us feeling empty. They can leave us feeling unfulfilled. Sometimes those desires, when we think that we are actually getting a hold of what we wanted, what we've strived for, what we've doubled down on, when we actually grab hold of it, we realize, oh, it's just a cheap imitation of what I'm really searching for. It's just an empty shell. Man, it looked good. We realize whenever we grasp that thing that our heart has desired, that it's just um, some more of the same old, same old that we've put up with. And we walk away empty-handed. We walk away depressed. We walk away discouraged and disappointed. But I want you to hear me this morning. Today, Jesus offers a solution. He, he beckons us to come to him, not with perfectly formed prayers or spiritual achievements, but he 
beckons us to come to him simply with our thirst. Now, I've got to move quickly here, but I want to outline four types of thirst that Jesus can and Jesus will satisfy in our life. The first is the thirst for happiness. The thirst for happiness. Let's go back to the first thing that I mentioned whenever I started preaching about this desert traveler that's crawling through the desert. He's parched. He's desperate. You know, happiness is a lot like water. It's a basic human need. And we chase after happiness more than we realize it. We chase after happiness in our relationships. We chase after happiness in our careers. We chase after happiness in the possessions, the toys that we buy. The boat, the truck, the whatever it might be. We chase after happiness. But here's the real deal. We, we do so very often, and we realize whenever, like I said, we obtain that happiness. When we think we're about to be happy, we end up, it's just a fleeting satisfaction. It doesn't last. It's like, have you ever been invited to someone's house, and you walk in, and the food smells so good until you take a bite of it, and it's nasty. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3 says, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For wisdom is more precious than silver, and her gain is more profitable than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. And her ways are pleasant ways. All of her paths lead to peace. Here's my point on this. True happiness isn't found in fleeting pleasures, but true happiness is found in a relationship with God who provides joy and purpose in our life. The second thing I'd like to point out to you is that the second type of thirst is the thirst for righteousness, the thirst for righteousness. And if you were to take all of the Greek and the Hebrew ways of defining righteousness and boil them down, basically it means the condition of being acceptable to God. I want you to imagine this morning a man that is lost in a maze. Lost in a maze. Now, every year for Christmas... One of the gifts that we buy our children is season passes to the water park in Birmingham. Have you ever been there? Anybody been there? No? All right. Well, every year that's something that our children just kind of expect. Whether they get anything else or not, they get a season pass. And I promise you that Alabama Splash Adventure loses on that transaction. Because my kids wear the place out. You can spray me with a water hose and I'm good with water for about three years. I don't care to swim at all. But my children and my wife love to go to the water parks. And they have this outing to the water park planned down to a perfect science. Because Mrs. Burdine likes to get in that tube and ride around the lazy river. I go around the lazy river twice. I'm ready to get out. Mrs. Burdine will stay in that lazy river for eight hours. <laughs> Not Mr. Burdine. <laughs> but she has this planned out to a science because we've got a little wagon that we pull behind us to the beach. And in that wagon, she's got every square inch perfectly laid out. She's got bags that have extra clothes. She's got extra towels. She's got first aid kit, she's got sunscreen, she's got speakers, she's got drinks, she's got everything that you can imagine. She's got it planned out. She knows that we need our Yeti cups. She knows that we need all of these different things. And whenever we get there, there's a certain route that we take. We don't like to go into the place and dress with all the other weirdos. 
So there's a spot that we stop, and we've already got our, su our swimming suits on underneath of our regular clothes. So we stop off on the side away from everybody, and we get down to our swimming suit. Then we spray on the sunscreen. And the very first thing after we do that, you walk by this water maze. The little Hadley Wyatt, they go in the maze, and they can go in and be out in 20 seconds. If you go down the right path in this maze, you're going to stay dry. But if you're going to go down the wrong path in this maze, you're going to get buckets of water poured on top of you, and you're going to get sprayed in the face with water. Guess who gets buckets of water sprayed on them? I, I, I don't know how to get out of the maze because I need someone to lead me. Now, if I'm with my children, they can navigate me through this maze. But when I'm left to my own devices, when I'm left to my own leading, I get lost. I need someone to lead me. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's where righteousness is because in every person's heart, they want to do what's right. We all have a desire to do what's right, but we often fall short. We don't know which way to go. We want to be pleasing to God or righteous, but we need help. Every one of us is that way. But Jesus, he offers not just forgiveness for our wrongdoings, but he offers the power to live a righteous life through the Holy Spirit. The third type of thirst is the thirst for love. The thirst for love. I want you to probably all of us know a lonely person that has longed for love. They've longed for companionship. They've longed for a relationship. They've longed for connection with someone. We are social creatures. God made us. He designed us for love. But sometimes we feel isolated. We feel um, unlovable. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 John writes this, he says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, human love is limited. It's flawed. It's precious, but it's limited. It's precious, but it's imperfect. You know, human love is marked with jealousy. Human love is marked with insecurities. Human love is marked with conditions. But I want you to know that Jesus is the fountain of all love. His love is boundless. His love is unconditional. His love is ever-present. Whether you make him happy or whether you don't, his love is still abiding with you. His love has the power to transform our lives and it will fill the void that no human love can fill. And until we have experienced love from him, all of our other attempts at love are going to be a mirage. They're going to be empty. They're going to leave us with a sense of emptiness. God's love is the deepest source of fulfillment. And he offers us unconditional love that transcends all of our human limitations. His love is deep. His love is wide. And then the final thirst that I want to mention, Haram, if you want to come back, Sebastian, if you want to help him, is the thirst for life. Have you ever been with someone whenever they faced death's door? Have you ever been with someone as they look into eternity? I grew up a pastor's son. I was at the funeral home all the time. I was in the hospitals all the time with my dad. I've been there in the rooms with people as they pass from this life to the other. And whenever we talk about thirst for life, this is a deep and powerful thirst because when one comes to the edge of eternity, perhaps they're at the edge of eternal darkness without Christ. 
our souls pull back and cry out for life. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And they reach out for any sign of life, no matter how far away it seems. Who can give us this? Who can satisfy this need? Who can satisfy this need? You see, we think we are powerful. But can a person really live without him? Can they? Can a person really live without him? Are we so attached to our suffering? Are we so attached to um, the things that we think are important that we are willing to choose it over the promise of eternal life that he can bring to us? Is our agreement with death so precious that we would turn away from the light of life? John writes just a few chapters later about Jesus. He says, Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Church, I'm going to look at you this morning. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Jesus offers us not just an extension of our earthly lives, but he offers us eternal life in his presence. So in conclusion, before we open up to communion here this morning, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you thirsty this morning? Are you thirsty for Jesus? I beg of you to not try to Satisfy that thirst with substitutes that are cheap substitutes. But receive the living water that can satisfy your deepest desire that's only found in Jesus. And I pray not only for you, but I pray for myself that we all remain thirsty believers. Thirsty for Jesus. for a moment before we have the elders come and help us.